Good afternoon. I'm Ahmed Yagzan from the American Dream Law Office. Uh, I guess I'm the I'm the head of the American Dream at the American Dream Law Office. My name is Ahmed Yagzan, as I said, and we are on with you guys from the headquarters on Park Boulevard uh, in Benelos Park. We do have offices in Washington D.C., in Tampa, in Orlando, in Miami and uh, overseas in Beijing, we do, have a, we do have an affiliate office. So what we're trying to do today is talk to you about some immigration questions. Uh, I do have to, I'm a lawyer, so I kind of have to start with the legalese. Uh, today, even if you send me a question, um, this does not constitute legal advice. Please don't listen to it as it applies to you or don't think that it applies to you personally. Uh, what I'm trying to do here is just give uh, general immigration information. Please, 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 if you have a particular question about your case, do not post it on the question and answers and send it personal to me or call my office at one eight 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 nine six dream which is one eight 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 nine six three seven three two six, and schedule a consultation and I'll be more than happy to discuss your particular case with you. Now, we have invested a lot of money in the last couple of months in technology. We do have a professional setup here for videos and, and, uh, and everything. So we, I promise you we're going to make this a monthly thing where I answer all your questions about immigration. We're going to make it a less, uh, at the same time on last Thursday every month we're going to make this we're gonna make this event uh, go live every every Thursday, uh, every last Thursday of the month. We're gonna make this happen at one o'clock. So if you have any questions, I'm going to give you my email for my paralegal, and please send her an email with any questions that you have. We've gotten more than ten questions for this session today, so just make sure that you email it to her probably a week in advance. So I guess uh, third Thursday of the month. Send your questions in, and I'll be more than happy to answer them on this session. I want to start uh, by, by thanking my wonderful staff. It's been, it's been a, a trying couple of months for a lot of us. Uh, the, the good thing about the American Dream Law Office when I started it was the use of technology. Since 2015, we've been able to literally pick up everything and move on a whim if we need to. Uh, all of you know that I travel a lot, so I work from overseas as if I'm in the office. My staff has been fantastic over the last couple of months since, since March in the middle of this COVID. We really haven't missed the beat. We're still signing up clients. We're still talking on video. We're talking on, on the phone. We're signing up clients, making some American dreams reality. So I want to thank my staff for actually making this possible too. They set up my camera and my microphone and all of that stuff. I'm going to start with a couple of uh, really broad things. Uh, the first thing that I want to talk about is that if you have overstayed your visa in uh, the COVID era in the last couple of months from March until, until now in the last two and a half months, please let me know. We've been able to actually get a lot of extensions for people who came in on the visa waiver program. It really depends on which port, which port of entry you use to come to the United States. It's been sporadic. For example, the Tampa airport had not been taking any, any of these uh, requests, so we had to send them to Orlando. So if you have an ESTA and it's coming to expire very soon, please let me know. I would be more than happy to help you get an extension. So when you try to come back, back in, um, I'll be more than happy you know, to do it. So when you come back in, you won't have a problem or they won't reject your ESTA. If you are on a regular B1, B2 visa and your flight has been canceled, and you have to stay in the United States past the time of you, of you being here in the United States, past the time that they gave you on the stamp. Please let me know and I'll be more than happy to actually get you an extension. That's a little easier than having to do it if you're on ESTA, but call me. Again, the number is one 963 7326 I am going to post some links here, um, my website, AmericanDreamLawOffice.com, has a lot of things for you to read. 
Uh, I post on it every single month. We post a video. Uh, actually, every single week we post a video, and my marketing team sends all, spends a lot of time redoing it, putting blog posts and all that stuff. So if you want to go to my uh, website and subscribe to my uh, to my blog, I would really appreciate it. I also posted links for all of my social media profiles. I really would appreciate it. Any people who are looking at this, I would really appreciate it if you, especially the YouTube one, because they do ask for a hundred for a hundred people uh, to subscribe to your channel before you can actually get a vanity name. So I'd appreciate it if you can go and actually post that for me and follow it for me, so I can get that great American Dream Law Office. Uh, vanity name after I reach 100 followers. I think we're at like 15 or 20 right now. So the, let's start with a couple of questions. Uh, immigration actually closed, USCIS offices closed for two and a half months. Yesterday they started, um, they, they actually announced that on June 4th, which is next week, they're gonna start uh, taking in-person uh, appointments again. So. Uh, we have clients who were, we successfully got their citizenship, their N-400 applications were approved, but we were supposed to go to the swearing ceremonies, and I absolutely love going to, to the swearing ceremonies because you see people from all over the country, and this is what makes this country great. Uh, you see people from all over the world, probably 40 or 50 countries in each of these ceremonies. Now immigration is going to start doing these swearing in ceremonies again. Um, if you haven't had a chance to, to go to one, um, make sure, they do have them at HCC sometimes, we take, take thousands of people. Uh, so if you actually get to go to, to one, honestly, you would be proud to be an American. You see these new faces that just started their American dream, just, just go to one of them if you can. So immigration, is actually a lot doing these swearing in ceremonies. They're saying they're going to limit them in duration and how many how many people can be there. So if there might be some backup with the swearing ceremonies, but if you got an approval on an N four hundred before you uh, before of the closure of USCIS offices because of COVID nineteen, they will automatically reschedule you for a swearing in ceremony in the last couple of months. Hopefully. You will be able to uh, you'll be able to actually get that get that done before November, so you'll be able to register the vote. Speaking of naturalization, this is really cool. I've never done this before, so if you want to apply for citizenship, we are having special until the end of June, and I actually limited the time until the end of June uh, because I do want people to be able to to hopefully, if things go okay, be able to register to vote in November 2020. I really don't care who you vote for. I want to make you a citizen. So just call my office, schedule a consultation. If you don't have any, any problems with your background like arrest or criminal convictions, I am extending an offer to you for $2,020. Uh, thank you to my Facebook friend who told me I need to change it to 2020 because it was pretty cool. So $2,020, not including the filing fees. I will apply for your citizenship and I will go with you if you live within the Tampa or Orlando, uh, Orlando jurisdiction. I will go with you to the interview beginning to end for $2,020, which honestly is a great deal. I usually charge a little more extra than that. So if you want to apply for citizenship, call me. Again, the number is one eight 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 nine six dream And we're open 24-7. The staff will speak to you in English or Spanish and schedule you to come and talk to me. Um, there is a question about COVID-19 travel restrictions made us postpone our wedding. If I leave the country, will it be a problem? Now, that would really depend on a lot of things. Uh, the first thing is the type of visa that you're here on uh, it really, really, really changes. There's something called immigrant intent and immigration law. So if you come in on a B1, B2 visa, which is the most common one, that's a visitor visa, run-of-the-mill visitor visa for people to come here to the United States. If you come in on that, you cannot have an immigrant intent. So you cannot come here and, and say, I wanna get married to someone, I wanna get my permanent residence. So if you're in that category and you're trying to get married and it's gonna happen within the next couple of months, and if you're getting married to a United States citizen, I'm not telling you to break the law, 
but leaving when you're married on a B1, B2 might actually create some issues for you when you, when you try to come back into the country. I've seen people get denied, uh, get denied entry after they get married, so you're going to have issues trying to come back into the United States. Before, again, and I, and, and I say this, I, when I applied for my green card and my citizenship and all that stuff, I actually hired an attorney to do it. So before you leave, hire an attorney, speak to an attorney, and get their advice before you leave. Now, if, you're not, if you have six months and you're trying to stay here and your wedding, you can postpone a wedding a couple of months and then stay here in the United States and apply for your permanent residence and you're going to be married to a United States citizen, immigration is a little more forgiving. You will be able to actually stay. If you're married to a U.S. citizen, they kind of forgive the overstay uh, and they will work with you. So don't leave the country without speaking to an attorney. Uh, I think that's the best advice that I can give to the to the uh, to the person who actually sent us the question. It said uh, the second, the third question that we have. I got my green card from my spouse. Who do? I, uh, what do? Why do I need to remove conditions? Okay, so in 1985, uh, Congress Congress passed uh, a marriage fraud act. Uh, there were a lot of people who who uh, married people for. A green card so you we can't we call them fraudulent marriages by the way if you're married for a green card please don't call me because I don't take these cases uh, and and that's why we have a great reputation of going to USCIS because they know that we don't take uh, fraudulent marriage cases um, so when you actually in 1985 Congress passed that law that said that if you're married and your marriage is less than two years old you do have to go, you do have to uh, apply, and then when you apply, you get what's called a conditional permanent residence. Conditional permanent residence means you're a permanent resident, but it does have that conditional on it. Why is it conditional? Because uh, it's, it's not permanent. It's not really permanent. It, ha it has conditions on it. So what Congress said is that 90 days before the two years anniversary of the first green card which is a conditional permanent residence you have to apply for something called removal of condition those are some of the hardest cases especially if you have a divorce or you separated from your spouse after you got the initial green card it's going to to create some problems for you so again call an attorney don't do it on your own if you have some sort of some sort of problem in the marriage again it's going to be more complicated than a joint marriage. A joint, it, so, so there are a couple of ways to do it. If you're married, you're in love, you're happy, uh, and you want to apply for, for the removal of conditions, you apply jointly with your spouse. Your spouse will sign the, uh, would sign the petition just like you, and we will send it into to immigration and put as much as possible, we put evidence in the, um, into the petition for them to actually, you know, Sometimes they used to waive the interviews if, if they really believe you, you don't have to go to an interview and we can, and we can uh, actually get the conditions removed before. Now, there are three or four waivers which are honestly beyond the scope of this, of this video, but there are waivers of that joint uh, petition uh, requirement. You can do it for abuse, you can do a good faith marriage, you can do a hardship, a hardship waiver, but then you're, that, that case is getting more complicated than just run of a mill, you know, uh, a two, you know, two people married and, and they're going to they're gonna file those petitions together. Now, a cool trick, if you're married to a United States citizen and uh, you've had your permanent residence, these petitions are actually taking a very long time to get. Uh, to get approved by immigration, to get processed by immigration. So what we can possibly do is apply for your citizenship, to, citizenship during that pendency of that, of that petition. So if you've had your permanent residence for the certain, a certain amount of time, even though your 751 is still pending, we can still apply for your citizenship and usually they actually combine the interview for both of them. So if you have one of those petitions pending, and it's taken too long and you're still married and you're happy in your marriage, please let us know again, you know the number, and, uh, and I'll be more than happy to see what I can do for you.
But removal of conditions is very important because I've had clients that forgot to apply within the 90 days uh, before, before, the, uh, before the expiration of the card and they literally ended up in removal proceedings. Because what the statute says is that if immigration doesn't believe that your marriage was bona fide, the only person that can remove those petitions is a, an immigration judge. And usually you cannot get remarried or married to another United States citizen and for that person to petition for you unless that, those conditions were removed from the, uh, from, the old, from the old green card. So it's very important to hire an attorney because you don't want to end up in removal proceedings because we go from a small amount of money to apply for the removal of conditions to someone having to go with you to, to immigration court to defend you and let you stay in the United States and convince a judge compared to just an officer that your marriage is bona fide. Please don't do it on your own. Again, call an attorney. We have great options at the American Dream Law Office. Call us. We do this all over the country. Give us a call and we'd be more than happy to help. Um, there is a question that says, I came as a refugee and now I have a green card. Can I apply for my mom to come live here in the United States with me? And the answer is no. If you're only a green card holder, you cannot apply for, for parents to come to the United States. Only way for you to apply for parents is after you become a United States citizen, uh, then they become immediate relatives. And then after that, you're, you're, you, you can apply for your, uh, for your parents to come here to the United States. So the question, the question is a little more complicated than the answer. So I'll, we'll go through it part by part. Uh, it says, he came in as a refugee. Refugees are really cool. Uh, we absolutely love. Whenever I hear the word refugee, I actually remember Lady Liberty, who's which actually our emblem, uh, that we're welcoming of all refugees. So uh, thank you to whoever sent that that question. I really absolutely love doing asylum cases when they're here in the United States. So if you're a refugee and you come to the United States, that data admission is very important. It's it's very important because. Uh, when you're applying for citizenship down the road, the date of your admission is the date that they actually use, uh, not the date of, uh, not the date that you actually get the green card. So you backtracks like a year or so when you actually become coming as a refugee. So that's one year. So after you get your green card, you only have to wait forty years to to actually come and apply for your for your citizenship into the United States. You do have. We'll discuss citizenship in a second. But you do have to have that five years to apply for your citizenship. Now, uh, once you become a permanent resident, you, you do have to apply for permanent resident. Uh, you apply for citizenship, and after be, you become a citizen, you can apply for a for a parent, and you can apply for a brother or a sister. Now, the parent is is immediately uh, that's an immediate relative petition, but the brother or sister would be actually it would not be uh, an immediate relative petition. Um, and it will be, it will be for, um, it, will, it will be, you have to wait for a visa number to be, to be available for that person to come to the United States. Now, if you are a permanent resident and you want to apply for a spouse, that's actually allowed or an unmarried, uh, unmar unmarried child that you have overseas, you can actually apply. But hopefully if you have a ref if you applied for refugee status and uh, you were married or you had children, I have a lot of friends who came who came from Iraq over here as as uh, as refugees. So if you are actually applying for refugee status overseas, hopefully you ha would have applied for these people to come, for these family members to come with you, so you don't have to wait. But if you came here as a refugee and then become a permanent resident, yes, you can. Act if you and you marry down the road, you can actually apply for for your for your uh, for your you know spouse and your children. However, you do have to wait for a visa number to be available. Now, the nice thing about now is that the numbers are current for that category and the uh, visa bulletin. So if you want to apply for, if you have a green card and you want to apply for your spouse uh, and your children, call me. Again, the number is one eight 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 nine six dream The last question is, I want to marry my cousin and bring them from overseas. Which... Uh, not legal in the United States. It's not legal in the, in the state where they actually live. What can I do? So here is here is what 
this is this is a really complicated question. Um, the for immigration purposes, the place of marriage is the one that actually dictates if they can come here on an immigrant visa or not. So let's say you get married overseas. My both my parents were cousins. So let's say my dad lived in the United States and my mother lived overseas and, went, and they went and get married. If that uh, if that actual marriage is legal in that country, that is a country that applies for immigration purposes. So if you get married in Lebanon or in Jordan or Saudi Arabia where they allow it, you can actually bring your spouse over here. Again, uh, the distinction is what's your status as a petitioner? Are you a United States citizen? Or are you a green card holder? If you are a United States citizen, that's an immediate relative petition. They come in fairly quickly within a year to a year and a half. They will be here in the United States. If you are a green card holder as a petitioner, then you have to actually wait for a visa number to be available. I do have a couple more more questions, and we're going to we're going to answer them one by one. And I'm sorry about that. I dropped something on the floor. Um, so, one of the questions is. Can I adjust your, my status if I overstayed my visa? And I kind of alluded on that a, a, a little bit ago. If you are here in the United States and you are married to a United States citizen, for example, and you want to adjust your status, immigration is a little more forgiving than if you, if you are married to a green card holder. If you are married to a green card holder, you have to be in status at the time of adjudication of the green card petition. So for example, I had a case a couple of years ago. Someone is actually a permanent resident. They submitted a green card, green card petition for their spouse by another uh, another attorney. And when we went to the interview, they told us, "No, they cannot, you know, do it." I was just representing them at the interview, and I had to explain to them that this is what actually happened. We were we were successful in getting him permanent residence a different way. Uh, but just watch out if you're married to a green card holder you do have to be in status at the time when you when you actually get uh, go to that interview for you to be able to actually get that green card so here's a great example if you are married to a US uh, to a green card holder and you're in H1B status and your H1B work is is uh, is current at the time of the interview you're gonna you're not gonna have a problem you can actually go to, to, to the interview and get your permanent residence. Uh, another question is, can I apply for my green card in immigration court? And I absolutely you can. There are some more tricks to it. Again, the distinction between the petitioner being a United States citizen and the petitioner being a, a green card holder applies in immigration court. One time, you know, another another thing that you can do is that if you do petition for someone as a green card holder, and then uh, down down the road you become a citizen yourself, you know, we remove that condition that you have to be in status to receive your permanent residence. So a lot of times, what I do is I actually apply for a, for a petition for an immigrant visa petition for a beneficiary, and at the time if the spouse is eligible for for citizenship then what we do is we apply for both of them at the same time because chances are when you when uh, when that person be, that person is going to become a United States citizen quicker than the I130 getting approved so we will, what we will do is we will we will move the category for the immigration immigrant visa petition to a different category to an immediate relative compared to being just a, a, a the spouse or a child of a, of a United States uh, of a permanent resident uh, so in immigration court, uh, let's say you you get you apply for asylum that's denied. You came in legally to the United States, and you know Cupid works his magic, and you get married to a United States citizen, and you want to apply for a green card um, in immigration court. So there there are a couple of things that you have to do. Uh, the because you are in removal proceedings, immigration, which is USCIS will not have jurisdiction to give you permanent residence. But the first part of that, which is the immigrant visa petition, actually gets adjudicated by USCIS. But then 
So what we usually have to do is just apply for the immigrant visa petition by itself and then apply for the permanent residence down the road before, before the immigration judge. When you are in removal proceedings, you do have to prove that your marriage is real. You know, the, the criteria is more stringent than just having a, uh, the, just not applying for, for an immigrant visa petition with, uh, when you're not in removal proceedings. So you do have to go to an interview, which is usually not required if you're not in removal proceedings. And usually, you know, immigration really asks a lot of questions and you have to put a lot of evidence in, in those petitions. So once that I-130 gets approved, then you apply for the green card in front of the immigration judge. Um, so that's 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 the process when you're when you're in removal proceedings applying for a green card. We do a lot of uh, we do a lot of uh, removal proceedings work. So our immigration court here in Central Florida is in Orlando, but I do cases all over the country. I've gone to Boston. I've gone to Miami. Uh, I've gone to to Texas. So if you have a, a if you have a relative who is in removal proceedings, please let us know. Again, you know the number. It's one eight 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 nine six dream. Just give us a call, and I would be more than happy to help. Um, and the last question that we have is: Can I apply for asylum after I come in on a visitor's visa to the United States? <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, usually the answer is is yes, but the law for asylees is, is very is very complicated. Usually you have to, conduct, after you come to the United States, you have one year to apply for, for asylum unless you apply for, uh, uh, you get an exception for that one year filing, uh, filing deadline or there's some sort of change circumstances. So let's say uh, John Smith comes from the Bahamas and he is afraid because the sharks over there are, are uh, you know, giving him a hard time. I'm just messing. But he has a threat to go back to the Bahamas and he wants to apply for, for, for asylum. So if he comes today, which is May, what is it, 28th, 2020, he has until May 27th, 2020 to apply for asylum, for asylum. Usually when you come here, uh, you, if you want to work, you have to wait between 150 and 180 days for you to submit that application. They used to take about three weeks to, do, to be done, but now there's a lot of backlog, so they're to taking about four to five months to, to actually process them. Under renewals, it's a little longer. So you, after, after you pass that 180 days, you get, a, you get an employment card. Usually they move very quick on, get an, on getting the interviews. Uh, so if you're in status when you're when when you get your interview, you will get you will get your decision and they will tell you have a good day. If you are not in status, they're actually going to refer your case to the immigration judge. It's technically not a denial of your asylum application, but you have to actually you, you need to go in front of the immigration judge to apply for the asylum. So there there are a lot of different things that you have to do, uh, but yes. If you come here to the United States on a B1, B2 visa, you can apply for asylum um, and ad apply for adjustment of status after a year, after, if you're, after you get approved in front of an immigration judge or, or immigration that's at the asylum office. Uh, I think we're coming up on 30 minutes here. I think we answered all the questions we have. Thank you very much for, for uh, watching. Again, I need you to please do me a favor go to uh, my Facebook page, our Facebook page, go our YouTube channel, our Instagram, and our Twitter. Please follow us. We need the followers, especially on YouTube. Our website is great. We got a lot of visitors on our website, but we just need the followers on social media to see how great we are. And then go to my website. If you have any questions 24 seven, you can send us a message and we will call you. We're open 24-7 at 1-888-963-7326. And if you're calling from outside the United States, it's 727-317-9757. Give us a call. We'll schedule you for, for a strategy session with me. I do video. I do, I do them all over the, the world. We do video. We do in person. And I would be more than happy to help you. Again, I'm Ahmed Yaqzan. 
the head of the American Dream team at the American Dream Law Office. I would be more than happy to help you make your American Dream a reality. Call us. The phone number is one 963 7326 Thank you very much for watching today. And if you have any questions, call. Thank you.